Welcome again to Valente Brothers TV, again from North Miami Beach. Today we're here actually in one of our private rooms at Valente Brothers headquarters and we're going to talk about Jiu Jitsu terminology. It's important for us to understand the names, uh, where the names come from, so that we can all try to maintain these names and create one universal language in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu Brasileiro, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. It's important for us to remember where we come from. Jiu Jitsu comes from Japan, but it was in Brazil that it developed to what we practice today. So Pedro, talk to us about Jiu Jitsu terminology or nomenclature, the names of Jiu Jitsu. Well, originally Jiu Jitsu is from Japan and the Japanese always utilized names which either describe the position or the body parts involved in the move. The names are very descriptive in nature. When Jiu Jitsu came to Brazil, originally with Grandmaster Carlos Gracie learning from the Japanese Mitsuyo Maeda and then his brothers, Grandmaster Helio Gracie, in Rio, really developing the system, they used also very descriptive names in Portuguese to be able to practice Jiu Jitsu. Names like estrangulamento, chave de braço, estrangulamento meaning choke, chave de braço meaning arm lock. And estrangulamento, for example, he not just invented a name or different move, but estrangulamento was also very particular to Grandmaster Helio. He really adapted that move. He added a lot of refinements of that technique compared to everything that we've researched from Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. Absolutely. That's something that was very particular to him. And he uh, really worked on that technique. Being a very small um, practitioner, he had to develop the skills and really refine those skills in his quest to make it work against much bigger and stronger opponents. It became a Brazilian estrangulamento, a Brazilian became, choke. Yes. With technique and also remembering that Grandmaster Eddie was very small and weak, so adding a lot of leverage to it. Another very interesting um, point about the word estrangulamento is that the way we, we, we say estrangulamento is um, based on the fact that we're Carioca, we're from Rio de Janeiro, and the accent is quite different from other parts of Brazil. And because in Jiu Jitsu, because in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the first generation, the second generation, the third generation of um, black belts, even though Carlos and Hélio come from Belém do Pará, um, were from Rio de Janeiro. So the words have that Carioca influence. Yes, definitely. And, and, and so all the chokes that were used, they referred to as estrangulamento. All the arm locks, be it the bent arm locks, the straight arm locks, the arm bar, they were all referred to as arm locks, chave de pé. Chave de braço, you mean? Chave de braço. Yes. They were referred to as chave de braço in Brazil. Chave de pé for the foot lock, chave de calcanhar, the heel hook. So there were no, not too many names. And chave, when referred to an arm lock, chave de braço, chave, even though chave is a key, but the translation becomes a lock. That's what the, the actual translation was. So it was yeah, in English they were use lock, in Portuguese, and I think more the Latin language. I know that in languages, I know that in French is also Clos de Bras. They use the word key. Okay. So talk to us about the Mata Leon. Um, the Mata Leon became very famous through its success, amazing success in uh, Vale Tudo, in MMA, and the name Mata Leon. Well, Mata Leon means lion killer. And I think it's exactly because of what you just said, the amazing effectiveness of this choke, the assumption being that you could even, it's so powerful that you could even kill a lion with it. And the proof is in the pudding. If you look at all the MMA fights and you look at MMA statistics, the number one submission in MMA history is the Matalian with almost 50%. Out of two submissions, out of every two submissions, almost one is the Matalian. Interesting thing about the Matalian is that in Japanese it's called Hadaka Jime, which means naked. Hadaka means naked, Jime means choke. And many people in America utilize that word to translate it to rear naked choke. But I think in our Jiu Jitsu schools we should maintain the name that was developed in Brazil, Matalian, 
because this choke was so much, as you said. Grandmaster Elio being so small, he, had, he felt that the choke was his best weapon. Because even though arm locks and foot locks and other submissions are great, they require a little bit more strength, especially when, when dealing with somebody much heavier. But the choke, he always felt that he could catch anybody with the choke. And that's why he spent so much time refining and developing the Japanese chokes, if you want to call it that way. And so I think that it's more than fair to use the names that were utilized in Brazil for them. What about the pisão, striking technique that was used um, heavily in the past by jiu-jitsu representatives in challenge matches against um, strikers? Um, what's the origin of that name? Well, pisão in Portuguese means a big step or stomp, if you want to call it that way. Um, when talking about kicking techniques in jiu-jitsu, there is usually two types of kicks. Round kicks, which were, used, which were named pontapé, the tip of the foot, because they went in a round manner and hit with another part of the foot or the shin. And then you had uh, the pisão, which is with the bottom of the foot, more like a stomp. And the Gracies used that technique um, a lot at that time. Grandmasters Carlos and Elio Gracie were experts in this technique. And it's something that was very important for them because of the self-defense value of the pisão. Not just the fact that you can hurt someone with that technique, but also you can manage the distance very well and stop a bigger person from punching and kicking you and being able to hurt you with strikes. So that was a big part of the jiu-jitsu strategy. And it was a very important technique in jiu-jitsu back in the day. The UPA, yeah. U-P-A, UPA. Growing up, that was the name um, that I learned, the mount escape. So talk about the UPA. Well, there's a big connection between horseback riding and jiu-jitsu. It goes back to the samurai. And Grandmaster Elio was always fascinated by horses. He was an amazing, amazing horse rider. He actually used to tame wild horses. And upa means bucking, the movement of the horse when the horse throws himself up and throws the person who's mounted up. That in Portuguese is called upa. Even um, sometimes when you have a little kid on your lap, you say upa, upa. That refers when you're simulating the movement of a horse playing with a little child. And so when you are underneath an opponent and you raise your hips, to escape or either to be able to upset his offense, this is referred to as upa and the escape, the upa escape, which where you raise your hips suddenly to be able to break your opponent's balance. Yeah. There was also a different name that was used. In barrigada. The past. Barrigada. Yeah. I think the lifting of the stomach or the hip, they also use the word barrigada. Which comes from the word barriga, which is stomach. Yes. What about the guillotina? The guillotina, um, very famous also today because of its uh, effectiveness in MMA. Yes, the guillotina is, was initially referred to as the, the gravata. In Brazil, we used it as um, the headlock. And so the guillotine is actually a, a, an instrument of, of the death penalty in, in, in France. During and the French Revolution. During the, during the French Revolution, it was utilized. And something that was a blade that came down and cut somebody's throat. Usually the head actually fell in a bucket. Yeah, and the, yeah. the, the interesting um, thing about that recently, reading about the French Revolution, the name guillotine, guillotine, the French name, comes from the fact that the person who invented this weapon um, was, his last name was guillotine. And exactly, and so because the guillotine, as taught by Grandmaster Helio, the blade of the arm, the radius, the bone on the inside of the forearm, goes straight into the throat, almost like it's cutting through the throat, because of that, they named it instead guillotine. of instead of a guillotine variation, which then becomes more of a headlock, a front headlock, which wraps the neck. So, keeping it more parallel to the ground and making the bone cut the neck is the guillotine. Exactly. Well, what about the word Americana, now, which could also be a, 
an American woman in Portuguese. <laughs> um, but the Americana, where's that name? Americana is also a very interesting one because there are a lot of stories regarding the Americana lock and sometimes some confusion. Um, recently, there was a story about a wrestler, I think it came out in a book if I'm not mistaken, a wrestler called Bob Anderson who went to Brazil and spent a lot of time training with Hollis Gracie, uh, the Gracie who was the champion of the family at the time and, and unfortunately died in a, in a hand gliding accident in the early 1980s. And apparently as he was training with Bob Anderson, Bob Anderson was utilizing a technique from the turtle position to turn the person onto his back and be able to pin him where he twisted the person's arm. And Hollish apparently liked that technique and started referring to it as the Americana. And then everything that involved twisting the arm became known as Americana. But the confusion is that people felt or thought that that technique came to Jiu-Jitsu with Bob Anderson. And that's absolutely not true. That's something that was in Jiu-Jitsu from the beginning and there's many videos on the internet to prove that. If you look at that old footage of Grandmaster Carlos Gracie training with Jorge Medi um, in a black and white video, he actually applies the Americana. There's pictures from the 30s of Grandmaster Helio and Grandmaster Carlos and the brothers using the Americana. Maybe they didn't use that name. Another theory for the Americana name is because a lot of people were using it in catch wrestling, catch as catch, catch as catchers can, which was very popular in America in the early 20th century and something that was used in that sport and so a lot of people started referring, in Brazil they call it Luta Livre Americana and so a lot of people started referring to that as Americana because it was used, they didn't wear the kimono and it was used a lot in that um, circuit. Well, but then there's the Kimura, which before that was credited to um, the great Kimura, one of Japan's, if not the greatest Japanese jiu-jitsu fighter that ever came out from Japan. What happened to that then? Well, then it's because before Bob Anderson, um, when Kimura came to Brazil, he really demonstrated amazing skills with the Kimura. And he was an expert in that move, applying it from many different positions, standing up on the ground. And he used it against Grandmaster Helio in their famous match. And so people started referring to that lock for lack of a name because everything was chave de braço, everything was arm lock, as Kimura's arm lock or Kimura's lock, chave do Kimura with the apostrophe S. And then little by little it became known as Kimura, but not everyone uses that. Some people call it Kimura, some people call it Americana. Just recently we had a seminar here in the school and the, the, the instructor was referring to this one as Americana too. Did Kimura break Grandmaster Helio's arm? No, he didn't. This is a, a misconception that comes from a book that Kimura wrote, apparently an autobiography. And I think that when Kimura wrote that book, he didn't know that the Graces were going to become so famous. And I think that maybe it's normal with books. Maybe it wasn't even him. Maybe it were the editors of the book and trying to make the, the fight a little bit more attractive and a little bit more dramatic. He writes that he twisted the arm and the bone broke once and then he kept going and the, bro and the, and the bone broke again. Which would, only, which would have only uh, made Grandmaster Helio's um, will not to tap greater. Yes, and, and there's nothing wrong with that yeah. if he had broken it, but the truth is that he didn't. We have to clarify and make sure that people know the truth. Um, Grandmaster Carlos Gracie, who was in Grandmaster Helio's corner, he felt that it was a dangerous position, and it was, and Kimura had the arm locked. And, and Grandmaster Helio acknowledges the loss. But Carlos Gracie was the one who stopped the fight, and he, he walked into the mat and he tapped on Kimura and the fight was stopped. So he never threw a towel. Well, that's something that is uh, uh, something that I've researched a lot because everybody talks about this towel, but my conclusion is that it was something that they use as an expression to throw in the towel. It means a corner uh, stoppage. 
but in all the pictures that I've analyzed, I've never seen Carlos Grace a pretty much just walked into the to the ring in Maracanã Stadium and just tapped on Kimura, telling him to stop. Yes, <laughs> and then he was grabbed by a federation uh, official, and and so the referee wanted the fight to continue. Kimura let go, and the referee said, "This is interference. This." The fight should continue. But they acknowledged. And Grandmaster Elio, who saw that his, fa his brother had stopped the match, he said, no, no I'm not going to do that. So, Pedro, there is a reason why it's important for us to, to have names that are universal in Jiu-Jitsu. And this is one of the objectives of this episode, is for us and Jiu-Jitsu try to share these names. Personally, I don't believe Jiu-Jitsu belongs to Japan, it doesn't belong to Brazil, it doesn't belong to any country. Um, even historically, you can say Jiu-Jitsu comes from India. And we have a theory that Jiu-Jitsu comes from mankind, in a way. Because um, from the early times of man, there was a necessity to fight and to defend against different attacks. And that is Jiu-Jitsu. That's the beginning of Jiu-Jitsu. But the Jiu-Jitsu that we practice, our grandmasters, come from Brazil. The Jiu-Jitsu that today became um, famous and accessible all over the world comes from Brazil. And I think it's important for us to, to credit our roots and for us to respect our origins. And in doing that, we're going to create a universal language in Jiu-Jitsu. Imagine tomorrow um, us going to a school in China or us, or us walking into a school in Russia and not understanding one single word of what is being said on the mat. A arm lock has a different name depending on the country you find yourself in a kimura, a pizão, a homoplata, all the names that we have been discussing today and so many other names will just be translated according to the place that jiu-jitsu is being practiced. And I don't think this is positive. I think we should share a universal language. In Brazil, in this process, as uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu, judo, you may say, was being adapted into what we practice today, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, some names kept their Japanese name, like the Katagatami, Katagatami, maintained its Japanese root. Because it's very associated to Judo. It was something that was not practiced by the Gracie brothers in the beginning. It's a technique that was not part of the original curriculum. But it's something that they learned and they felt was a good move and they started using it. Then it became part of the of the curriculum, but since it was very much associated to judo and it already had a very specific name to it, then many people kept in Brazil referring to that as the katagatami. The interesting um, element is when it was translated to English. A lot of people started calling it the arm triangle, which became a very popular name in English, but that's not a direct translation either from Portuguese. Portuguese, we don't have a word for that choke. We use the Japanese word. But it's definitely not a tr direct translation from the Japanese word because kata means shoulder and gatami means hold. And the reason... Shoulder hold, no? Shoulder hold. The reason why I think they use the name arm triangle is because of the fact that when you apply the triangle with the legs, One the arm, arm is, trapped. Is, always, is also in this position. But I think what's important to understand is that the reason why it's called triangle has nothing to do with the position of the arm. The reason why it's called triangle is because when you, uh, in English they call it figure four, when you, when you get your legs in that position, if you observe there is a triangle in between your in legs. In between your legs, yeah. And so that's why they call it triangle. And when you apply the katagatami, you cannot find any triangle in that move. So the, the translation in English of the Japanese name would be shoulder hold. And in Portuguese, many people still keep the Japanese name, which is katagatami. Yeah, it's very interesting that Ramesta Eddy was open to that. Yes. And even though it was, as you said, it was not part of his original curriculum, when he learned it through Japanese judo connections, he tested it 
and he added to his curriculum. Yes, and that's also true for some of the throwing techniques. Um, some of the ones that were learned by them originally and that were greatly refined, then they util utilized Brazilian names. But some of the ones that they learned later, then they kept the Japanese names. Because I think that in the beginning, when Maeda first came to Brazil, um, the nomenclature, even within the Japanese art, was not as organized as it became later with Jigoro Kano creating really a more organized system. And so they didn't really have specific names from what I understand. And that's why they, those initial names were all translated to Portuguese. Um, but once it became more organized and then they learned the techniques with those Japanese names, they kept the name. We talked about grappling techniques, different submissions. We talked about a striking technique, the pizon. Um, I think we should also talk a little bit about um, some throwing techniques that were very particular in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. The baiana. Well, baiana is the double leg takedown. With the Baiana name, it was because of Valdemar Santana, who was from Bahia, the state of Bahia in the northeast, the beautiful state of Bahia in the northeast of Brazil. And he came from there, and because he liked to go for the legs, for the double leg takedown a lot in his fights, then, and he, for him it was very easy. He was very strong and had great technique. He would just grab everybody's leg and throw them down. And so they started referring to that as a Baiana. What about the Passapé? Passapé. That's the sweep, the foot sweep. It's something that is... Uh, In Japanese, it could be maybe a deashibarai? It's a deashibarai. It's a deashibarai. But passapé is the word we always use in Portuguese for that. It's interesting that I think the names, the, the throwing techniques that were initially learned right from the get-go by Grandmaster Carlos Gracie, they used Brazilian names. I think because back then Maeda didn't have such structure. I think Jigoro Kano developed that later. He really organized the names. But then the throws that came later through their interaction with judo practitioners and Japanese practitioners, then they kept... Yeah, because the Osotogari, we never learned it as Osotogari from Grandmaster Helio. Queda de gancho. Queda de gancho, which is a uh, hook throw. Hook throw. Yeah. But Hanegoshi, for example, he always called it Hanegoshi, which is a Japanese name. That was one of his favorite throws and he used the name Hanegoshi. And you can find a very famous picture of Grandmaster Elio applying the throw to Grandmaster Carlos, where he's using a bent leg through his hip and he's lifting Grandmaster Carlos Gracie up. That's the Hanegoshi. Um, but going back to the passa pé, passa means probably a, a sweep. It could be, that would be the, the translation even though it's not the word. Yeah, because pass, passa is from passing. The foot passing. is passing in a certain direction, but yeah, foot sweep. Foot sweep. I think would, that's what it means. Passa pé means the foot sweeping through. Yeah, so some names are more descriptive and some names are more um, sometimes crediting people that did it, like the Kimura, like the Americana, like the Baiana. And there, and there um, are some names that also um, use a comparison to something, some other activity that resembles that move. For example, a masapão, which is a choke, a thrusting choke. And it, a masapão means kneading dough, which is uh, the way they prepare when they're making bread, the way they prepare the dough. And many times it's done with the knuckles. I actually, in researching and preparing for this uh, episode, Last night, I put kneading dough or masapão in YouTube, and even though there's a lot of people that, who use the palms, there's a lot of people in a technique where they use the knuckles. What about this right here? What's the name of this? Well, in Brazil, we call it tatami, which is a Japanese name. That was never changed in Brazil. We never used any other name. It's interesting that in America, they call it mats. But within the jiu-jitsu culture, the mats were always called tatan. What about? Well, we call it kimono, which was the, the, the word that was used prior to Jigoro Kano. Jigoro Kano then started using four specific judo kimonos, the word... Judo-gi, né? Gi, judo-gi, or do-gi. In Japan, they say do-gi. 
Um, but when Maeda came to Brazil, most likely he used the word kimono, and that's the one that the Gracies kept using, and it's still the word that's used in Brazil today to describe our kimono. Which, which, which is interesting also because it's not a specific, we don't like to, to view the kimono as a specific um, clothing just for um, jiu-jitsu practice, even though obviously we don't walk in the streets, um, usually we don't walk <laughs> in the streets dressed up with our kimonos, but it's connected to clothing. And that's also, you know, some of the questions we get on, on YouTube and on Facebook from our friends when they watch our videos is people notice that our kimonos are a little bit different from the ones used right now um, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competition in, in most schools, most brands. And Judo competition. And Judo competition. And for us, it's important that we maintain this light, clothing-like um, um, style to it. I think we should also, uh, in, in, uh, in the future, make a specific episode only on this because it's a very interesting matter. Yeah, because sometimes people compare it to karate kimonos, and it's, if you look closely, it's not really... It's, it's actually 100% based on the original yes. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kimono um, that was used even in our youth in the early part of the 1980s. It was a sport competition that they started creating a completely different Not type even of creating, kimono. copying the judo gi, the judo kimono, and because of that, it became single weaved and then double weaved, and then what happened, the difference between the judo kimono and the Brazilian jiu-jitsu kimono is that um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitors, because at the time, the Federation, the Jiu-Jitsu Federation was not so um, strict. What happened is that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners started buying Judo kimonos and cutting them, tailoring them um, to make it very difficult for fighters to grip. And that's what originated the more fitted Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu kimono compared to the Judo kimono. But this represents what Grandmasters Carlos and Edu Gracie uh, developed and used um, throughout their entire lives. Yeah, and it's more based on the original kimono from Japan, which is something that is used also in the streets. Yeah. Because our objective is to create something that is as, as close to street clothing as possible. Exactly. So, thank you, Pedro. Um, thank you guys for the amazing audience that we've been getting with all these videos. Uh, it's been actually surprising to see the number of views that these videos have been getting. Um, thank you again, and we'll see you guys in the future. Thank you.